Welcome to Down Ancient Trails, the online archaeology forum of the Sharma Center for Heritage Education India. Brush the dust off long forgotten thoughts. Slice through time and space. Listen to stories in stone. Whispers of voices lost in time. Build bridges across worlds. Curious minds reach out to the past. And travel down ancient trails. First, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Shanti Papu for, on behalf of myself and uh, Professor Shahal Abu, for the opportunity to be here with you. Um, the talk today uh, is about plant domestication in the Near East. Plant domestication uh, is part of a transformation known as the agricultural revolution, an overarching change in human perception and social economy and a major, a major cultural turning point in human history. We would like to present some aspects of plant domestication and plant domestication research in the Near East and if time permits, contemplate a bit on their significance in shaping our here and now. So we will present two perspectives of plant domestication in the Near East. One relates to cultural aspects, that is changes in culture as seen through the archeological record. And the second will be presented by Professor Shahal Abu and relates to biological aspects in the relevant species. In our case, the plant species known as the Near Eastern founder crops, including eight species of legumes and cereals, some of which you can see here. Now, this distinction of culture and biology is somewhat artificial because in many ways, the two grade into each other and are not easily uh, separated. Our goal for this uh, talk is to try and convince you that the model of plant domestication in the Near East that we support is of higher parsimony when compared to other models, which I will present in a moment after some introductory notes. For those of you who uh, do not closely follow plant domestication research in the Near East, let me just present two or three points as a short background. First point is uh, that the major actors, the major protagonists in the play of plant domestication in the Near East are archeologists who investigate culture, archeobotanists, investigating plant remains recovered in archeological sites. Biologists and geneticists investigating crop plant genetics. Agronomists studying crop adaptation and husbandry and geobotanists studying the environment and ecology of the relevant plants. A good script for this play, for this theater play would be in my view, based on creating a trustful interrelationship between three major actors, that is the biology of plants, the environment of plants and humans, and humans culture. And it should be done so that a synergetic interplay will take place between these actors, creating a whole that is bigger than the sum of its parts. The second point of this introduction is that basically now, as it stands now, 
There are two major models reconstructing plant domestication in the Near East. And basically we have to decide which of the two models shows a higher parsimony. The two models are, and you've uh, heard it uh, a minute ago in, in the introduction um, that presented us. On the one hand is the protracted autonomous model, which is non-centered and emphasizes a long protracted process that was geographically autonomous, that is non-centered, but diffused and characterized by an unconscious nature. On the other hand, is what we call the core area one event model, which is a centered, an alter alternative that is centered, a centered model that views Near Eastern uh, plant domestication as knowledge-based, conscious, occurring in a geographic la geographically limited uh, core area, and during a short single event. Although the second model in, in our view is corrobor corroborated by multiple lines of evidence, including archeology, span archeobotany, and genetics, it is currently a minority view. The third and uh, last point of this uh, introduction, and you may have noticed possibly that the models as they stand represent a set of dichotomies. And when looked at in more detail, these include amongst others, paired issues such as locality, which is the question, did plant domestication take place in a specific and well-defined core area within the Levant, which means it was highly localized, or did it occur independently, autonomously in different places and was diffused? And had it originated in one place, in a single area, where was it? So that's one pair. Process, did domestication occur in an exclusive single episode for each species and for the package as a whole, which is a singular timing, if you want to call it that way, or were there multiple domestications per species and thus by definition for the package as a whole? If so, it raises the question, how did the Neolithic package coalesce? Intent, was the process incidental or circumstantial, a result of evolutionary mutualism? Or was it a designated knowledge-based human initiative? Selection, were the choice of plant species and the selection of phenotypic types for domestication conscious or unconscious. And last length was the process fast an event as far as archeological resolution goes or millennia long or what they call protracted and took thousands of years. While it is difficult to, to separate the answers to these distinct yet interrelated questions, we would argue that making a decision in favor of the localized core area option, as we did, it looks like this. This can tip the balance concerning und uh, undecided paired topics and help in creating a coherent cultural and biological scenario of plant domestication in the Near East. This scenario may accord well with the currently available data as far as we uh, uh, see it. On the other hand, opting for an alternative geographically diffused autonomous model of independent domestication processes of each plant and in different locales within the Near East raises difficulties 
and leaves many, many unresolved questions. Just another short note. We know that researchers in recent years tend to view culture and cultural process, or cultural processes, and this includes domestication of plants and animals, within a macroevolutionary historical perspective. And as a continuous process comprising habitual fluid sequences of what is called socio-cultural environments. That's the way, for example, Melinda Zeder is uh, uh, describing it, or Eleni Asuti, or Dorian Fuller, and others. In other words, it is looked at, these processes are looked at as an interaction between man and plants, again, domestication included, and viewed as a continuum of transitional situations. These researchers oppose either or dualist type of traditions. We will nevertheless introduce views of such paired dichotomies with respect to plant domestication as they are comfortable devices uh, for, for a talk like this and for uh, as working hypotheses. I decided to focus on the where question. That is, is there a center in the Near East, a core area? And if so, where is this core area? I will, of course, try to convince you that there is a center, there is a core area, and that it is in the northern parts of the Levant, which are today parts of southeastern Turkey and northern Syria as you see here. I will focus on the cultural background of plant domestication and try to provide a picture of how the archeological cultural landscapes of these immense historical processes looked like in the Near East in the relevant time periods. It is a telegraphic view, somewhat simplified, maybe jumpy, and it is based on visible material culture elements, but I suppose that they reflect changes in perception and ideology as well. Transforming humans, world, or cultural nature relationships from the hunter-gatherer state described many years ago by Tim Ingold as trust to the food producing state described as a state of domination. This is a paper, a famous paper by Ingold written in the year 2000. So uh, here we go. Let's, let's first have a very brief look at major aspects that differentiate hunters gatherers from food producing farmers. This is of course the generalization again, hunters gatherers differ from food producing farmers in many, many aspects. And this little table will show you, and I will not uh, enlarge on that. They differ in settlement patterns and mobility, hunters gathering gatherers showing small ephemeral and mobile settlements, while farmers show large sedentary uh, uh, settlements. They differ in social structure, while hunters-gatherers show a fluid open to moves between groups and an egalitarian society, farmers show rigid and differentiated systems. They, of course, uh, are different in economy since hunters-gatherers uh, live, make their living of hunting and gathering, while farmers are based on food production, mostly agriculture of plants and animals. They differ in demography, hunters gatherers, showing, uh, hunters gatherers showing a low and stable demography, while uh, farmers show a high and growing demography. And they differ in perception, or what we call human world relationship. Hunters gatherers see the world positively as a giving environment, as it was stated by Nuit Bert David years ago,
while uh, farmers are, let's say, a bit more negative, surely manipulative, and usually quite confronting with nature. Recently, and I'm mentioning it, mentioning it because it's a study that started and was uh, uh, related to India, to the southern parts of India, following a long, uh, a long-term work with the Nayaka groups in southern India, where hunters-gatherers have moved quite rapidly to a state of gardeners and owners of domesticated animals, this divide between trust and domination was presented as a change from what was called a relational epistemology, that is trust, to object objectification, that is domination. But this was done in anthropological terms and is a bit, uh, is quite sophisticated. Now, all these represent a deep divide, a major perceptual and structural difference, and it is expressed in the low, very, very low ecological footprint of hunters gatherers, while the footprint of food producers, that is us, keeps growing, maybe to a point of no return. Now, how do these aspects look like in the archaeological landscape? Let's have a brief look at man's footprint in the landscape from above as the eagle flies. And we will take some flights, uh, each one dated to the, to the right date in order to see what we want to see. Uh, if we take a look at present day Bushmen's hunters gatherers hut, like this one, or a camp, like that one. And then we take a look, we take our first flight around 23,000 years ago over northern Israel and look at the site of Ohalon. We will see this for the hut, reconstructed like this, and this for the camp. And you may notice a similar picture. So hunters gatherers were there uh, uh, at that time for sure, and their footprint in the landscape is quite low. So if we take another flight over the northern parts of Israel 15,000 years ago, looking at the Natufian culture of northern Israel, we can see stone built houses, quite large, like this one nine meters diameter, densely built. There were many of them. We can see heavy facilities on site. We can see burials on site. And we can see a rich array of art objects, or what is called art objects, which were very rare before. Now, if we take another flight around 11,500 years ago in what is called the PPNA or the Pre-Pottery Neolithic Period A, the very beginning of the Neolithic period, we can see intensive settlements with mud bricks and stone rounded, rounded houses that you can see in sites large sites like the one shown here, that is Jericho in the Jordan Valley. And these are the rounded houses of Jericho made of mud brick. And similar ones can be seen in Netiv Agdud, Nachal Oren in the Carmel area, Jerfil Ahmar in Syria and more. Actually, some people would say that the beginning of the Neolithic would show towns such as Jericho that was encircled by a ditch and a wall with rounded towers that you can see here. There's no scale, but this is an immense uh, megalith. This is an immense structure. We can take another flight at the, about the same time or a bit later above a site called Gebekli Tepe in Turkey let's say 11,000 years ago. 
This is just a moment before domestication of plants and animals. And we can see an overwhelming growth and abnormal conditions for hunters and gatherers. We can see a manifestation of change in human world relations in these immense sites. We can see invested stone built enclosures, some of them as large as 30 meters in diameter, such as these or these, with amazing monumental art like this, like this. And this monumental art and sculpting shows many animal representations and mostly animal representations. This growth in scale, here's an animal, here's another, here's a wolf, here's another one with size. This, this, all this growth in scale represent a climax of sorts of hunters gatherers societies. But it was not accompanied by a change in economy. There is no evidence at Gebekli Tepe for domestication of plants or animals. This may have caused inevitable pressures, which may, at least partly, explain why hunters gatherers have changed their worldviews. Now, let's take another flight after the prepotary Neolithic A and all its abnormalities and fly again around 10,500 years ago, looking at the landscape of the people who domesticated plants and animals. This is in the period called the Prepotary Neolithic B, or the early Prepotary Neolithic B, and we can observe a real, another real turning point and a new landscape. This is expressed in many realms of culture, and in archaeological or in the archaeological arena. I'm sorry, uh, I, I apologize for my donkey that is now uh, saying hello to everyone. Um, <laughs> well, there are four of them here. I live on a farm. I have some animals. Um, so we, we fly again. When, when people start uh, domesticating animals and plants in the early Prepotary Neolithic B, and we see another turning point, the site nature. They are big, they uh, boast large societies, and they are farmers. And this, this is a, a picture of, of, of how the traditional village life in the Near East uh, is being reconstructed as so well known in Western world images. You can see the village, Tel Abu Huera. You can see the fields, you can see the roads, you can see the trees, and, and you can see the rocky uh, mountain around, the Zaltic Rocky Mountains or, or Leja, whatever it, it, you want to call it. So uh, th there is a, a new cycle in nature because people became farmers. There is a new type of architecture not rounded as it used to be for millennia, but rectangular, rectangular in shape, including domestic houses like this one that you can see from Chayuno in Turkey. And there are also, well, I'm very noisy, I'm sorry. And there are also uh, public buildings like the Chayonu skull house that you can see here with the many bones of, of over 500 uh, uh, buried people in this structure. Of course, there is a new, uh, and you can see that also in, in, um, in um, the temples of Nevalichuri, which is a public uh, uh, building. This is the early uh, preparatory Neolithic B. Of course, there is a new economy because this is the first time we have domesticates found in, in the archeological record. Now there's also new technologies such as for example, lime plaster, 
This comes from another place, but it's just an example. Light Blaster is the earliest pyrotechnology known in the Near East, and I guess uh, in the world, if we consider large-scale industries, because pyrotechnology was used much earlier for many uh, other purposes. There's also new technologies for blades, blade production, mainly for sickle blades and for arrowheads, new types of grinding stones, new types of storage facilities, water control, and more and more. Also, there are new types of burial practices that can be observed with new treatments of the dead and new imagery items such as this. Now, the art or imagery items are mainly anthropomorphous and not zoomorphous of animals, like this example that comes from Nevali Churi, uh, a PPNB site in, in, in Turkey. These early PPNB people and their predecessors in the preparatory Neolithic period in the region materialized the change, establishing fully agricultural systems that spread throughout the Near East and beyond. Although this is a very brief survey, it is clear that something significant was taking place just when the PPNA, the beginning of the Neolithic, has given way to the PPNB around 10,500 years ago. By 10,000 years ago, life ways based on domesticates and farming villages were fully established in most of the region. Now, just a fast run. Later in the Neolithic, further new technologies appear. They are accompanied by new burial customs, including skull treatment, the famous ones from Jericho and other sites, new paraphernalia, stone masks, also from the PPNB, and new perceptions regarding social ranking, gender systems, and religion. Later on, pottery appears, and somewhat later, metallurgy, including gold, then urbanization, and cities, cities with kings and taxes, cities with priests and temples, states with generals and armies, and so on and on to our modern condition. This is a whole series of revolutions which we are not going to talk about today. But if we try to attach some of these changes and the relevant archeological and archeobotanical finds and the results of biological and genetic analysis to the question of plant domestication in the Near East, if we compile the whole evidence, these are the changes along the line. If we compile the evidence that supports plant domestication in the Northern Levant core area that can be seen here on the, where the star is here, we can see that at the beginning of the PPNB, there will be a long list of elements that would uh, accord well with the model we suggest. Geobotanically, this is the only part or the only region in the Levant where all the wild progenitors of the eight package species appear together. In terms of archeology, span the suggested core area was a major active cultural center from which Neolithic innovations and materials spread to other parts of the Levant and beyond. This is supported by uh, uh, carbon-14 dates, recording the flow of uh, preparatory Neolithic cultural elements from the Northern Levant to the South to the West. 
This area also exhibited a shift in site character, architecture, burial customs, economy, and many material aspects, as well as in art items and symbolism, climaxing in the early pre-pottery Neolithic B with clear, direct, and well-dated evidence of plant and animal domestication, as we've seen before. To make this statement, one has to use the proper available resolution. I will say a word about resolution later on. As for the archaeobotanical records, the evidence is found for all packaged species in their wild form since the late Natufian and the PPNA, the Perpotory Neolithic A, if in the suggested core area prior to domestication and until 10,500 years ago. At about 10,500 years ago, there is the earliest evidence for domesticated plants in this area. And this is the earliest evidence for domesticated plants in the Near East. As for the genetics, Evidence indicates that the genetic stocks of progenitors of several packaged species that gave rise to domesticated forms are present in only a limited area of their broad distribution that you can see in this figure. In the suggested core area, we can, we can see that there is uh, the case there is a genetic case for emmer, emmer wheat, for acorn wheat, for chickpea, and for lentil. And recently, it was shown also for pea, and basically also for barley, although barley has some problems that I will not uh, uh, detail here. One additional point of our core area model is the pattern of spread of domesticates, domesticated plants, and farming as a system, as seen by archaeological, archaeobotanical, and cardboard 14 dating. This is very, this is very relevant to the choice between the two models I presented uh, in the beginning. Since the core area one event model predicts the spread of domesticated plants as populations from a center of domestication, that is southeastern Turkey and northern Syria. And it can be detected by temporal spatial patterns found within archaeological and archaeobotanical assemblages and by genetic footprints of introgression. It can be detected by the pattern of DNA polymorphism among the respective populations of plants. The protracted autonomous model, on the other hand, is expected to leave no such spatial patterns, neither among the archeological or archeobotanical data, nor among the DNA polymorphism data. For wheat and chickpea, based on available molecular genetic data, as well as on archaeobotanical remains, this may look like this, like a ripples or what we call a wave of advanced pattern radiating out of a, the proposed core area, which is encircled here by the dotted line. These ripples are also notable in works of other researchers, notwithstanding the domestication model they endorse. And indeed, the spread of domesticated plants within the Levant is in line with the spread of other cultural phenomena. Interestingly, this is also the case for the package of animals that includes goat, sheep, cattle, and pigs. Uh, the progenitors of all four domesticated animals overlap in an area that is quite similar 
to the core area that we suggested for plants. This is now true for human genetics as well, where ancient DNA can show that farming populations were leaving this region and going west as well as south and uh, to the east as well. So in conclusion, my answer is that there was a core area. It was in the Northern Levant on the middle Euphrates River where farming has started. And there's evidence for its fast spread within the Near East and beyond. And that within the next 2,500 years, major parts of Europe, Western Asia to the Indus Valley and North Africa will become agricultural. Now, one of the reasons why this model with these multiple lines of evidence is still a minority view relates to the fact that many of the actors in the theater play of plant domestication in the Near East ignore a major distinction. That is the distinction between plant domestication itself and crop evolution under domestication that takes place after domestication. And now uh, Professor Shachar Abu will talk about uh, this issue uh, in the coming minutes. No. Okay, thank you again for the invitation. Um, and let's let's go to the biological part. So I'm going to try and convince you that there is a distinction, um, not only cultural, uh, as Avi presented, but also biological and agronomic between plant domestication and crop evolution. And if some of you are interested, we can also, I can also talk about its relevance to uh, modern uh, uh, plant breeding. In, in other words, uh, uh, I will try to uh, refine some terms and uh, uh, concepts uh, pertaining to the uh, domestication syndrome, which is known to everybody who is uh, uh, interested in, in, in plant domestication. So we will talk a little bit about the domestication syndrome. I'll try to explain the distinction and those are the implications. So the domestication syndrome is is a concept that was developed by Karl Hammer, a German uh, botanist. And it can be defined as a suite of traits that are essential for the survival of wild plants in nature, and in which a genetic change uh, can be seen in, in the domesticated forms. It is of interest that uh, about 10 years earlier, before Karl Hammer's paper, uh, Jack Harlan, who was an American uh, 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 geneticist that uh, was highly influential in this, in this research area of plant domestication, he, he mentioned the same traits uh, like uh, non-shattering, for example, uh, um, larger seed size, uh, reduction in, in uh, uh, seed dormancy, for example, and many other traits, but uh, um, define them as adaptation uh, traits. Adaptation, meaning adaptation to the constructed environment, to the cultivated field, to the plowed field. And this is how it looks like, for example, this is a spike shattering in wild emmer wheat. Upon maturity, the, uh, the, uh, the spike disarticulates into the uh, propagules, which are uh, single spikelets, each carrying uh, a pair of seeds. And this is wild pea, shattering pods. Actually, you can see a single seed in here, still held by the pod, but all, all the other seeds are, are, are jump off the, uh, uh, the pod upon, uh, upon maturity. And an interesting observation uh, uh, related to this issue was made uh, many years ago by uh, my teacher, Professor Ladizhinsky, and he argued that because 
grain legumes, wild grain legumes. These include uh, lentil, pea, chickpea, but also uh, Asia and East Asia, like uh, many uh, 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 cowpea species and uh, azuki beans or soybeans, for example, uh, have strong uh, seed dormancy. Um, therefore, the uh, uh, release of the, uh, of the dormancy trait, allowing free germination, should be uh, considered a more important trait for the, uh, for the early farmers relative to uh, pod shattering, which was the uh, uh, traditional classical, uh, classical view. And in fact, this, was, uh, this view was confronted by uh, Danny Zoari, Professor the late uh, Daniel Zoari, uh, who uh, also uh, conducted lots of studies on, on Near Eastern plant domestication. And he insisted, following Ladizhinsky's arguments about the, 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 the cardinal importance of, of seed dormancy or, or lack of dormancy in the domesticated forms, that pulse domestication and cereal domestications are, uh, should not be seen as different and uh, both were domesticated by uh, 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 following the cultivation uh, operations conducted by the early farmers. And this is what they refer to as automatic selection. Those adaptations mentioned by Jack Harlan were automatically selected because of the husbandry operations, because of the cultivation. And in this sense, he insisted that uh, pod shattering is um, basically, uh, I mean, biologically, it is a parallel to the uh, uh, spike disarticulation, but he insisted that this is uh, the major uh, domestication traits in, in, in grain legumes. So basically here, this is another uh, uh, one of the dichotomies that uh, Avi Goffer uh, uh, mentioned earlier, where whether plant Plants were, domestications, uh, were domesticated by automatic, unconscious selection, under cultivation, or was it a knowledge-based selection of uh, specific mutants, specific traits that were selected from the wild and harnessed uh, for, the, uh, for food production? Now, uh, an interesting, uh, uh, an interest, uh, I think that, uh, uh, a useful approach to, uh, to look at this argument uh, or debate between what, what is more, more important or do, did a serial domestication occur uh, parallel to legume domestication and did they follow the same evolutionary trajectory is to, to, to investigate some of those adaptation traits and compare the situation in grain legumes and cereals, again, following uh, Gidon Ladezhinsky's argument. If we look at the population structure in legumes, it is patchy and thin, very few plants on every uh, place. If you look at the cereals, they have massive and thick populations. If you look at plant stature, legumes are short, creeping plants and not very productive. Cereals are tall and highly productive. In terms of growth habit, legumes have indeterminate growth habit. Cereals have a determinate growth habit. That is that the, the, uh, the stocks uh, end with a spike and there is no uh, additional growth after uh, flowering, while legumes in order to develop their yield needs to, uh, uh, to follow a continuous uh, growth pattern of, of flowering and growth. The dispersal unit in legumes have, are comoflage seeds, while in, in cereals, these are owned uh, spikelets. Dormancy in legumes is at the rate of 90%, while cereals uh, like barley and wheat show only 50% dormancy. This means that if you spread over your field uh, 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 a, a batch of cereal seeds, you will get uh, uh, full stand of, 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 of well-developed plants bearing spikes. And in terms of floral biology, 
Serials have mechanisms that allow between 5 to 10% cross-pollination, while in legumes, the, uh, uh, fertilization occurs before the flowers open. So this is the term cleistogamous uh, pollination used by, by botanists. And if you look at uh, um, the overall, the overall pattern that, that which is uh, the result of the combination of all those traits in the field, Legumes are poor competitors and they hardly compete with weeds while cereals, cereals have a very aggressive uh, growth pattern. So as, as, let, let us just look at just one example and this concerns the dormancy, okay? I will present some results from field experiments that we conducted some 10 years ago. So what we did, uh, we took uh, seeds from uh, wild three wild pea species and domesticated pea cultivars as controls. We planted 100 seeds per one square meter in the field. And we had two treatment, two treatments. The three wild species and the domesticated cultivars were subjected to seed scarification. And the other treatment were intact seeds. Seed scarification, if you peel a little bit, just a little bit from the seed coat, it releases the seed from the dormancy. It allows the seeds to uptake water and therefore germination is full, just like in the domesticated cultivars. And these experiments were conducted over three years in three sites each. That is nine field nurseries. And this is how it looked uh, upon the harvest, but here you can see some, some results. This is a shot of the field. I can, you can see that the, uh, there are empty, there are empty plots and there are full plots. So what are these? If you have, if you take, if you look at the intact wild, wild pea uh, uh, plots, okay, the three wild species, if the seeds are intact, germination is very low and seed yield is very low. Okay, remember that we had to put 100 seeds per square meter, that is 40 gram in each plot. So in some plots, the yield was lower than they invested. Okay, if you scarify the seeds, despite the fact that they all had shattering pods, the seed yield is much higher. It is, of course, you cannot compare it to the domesticated ones, which have, but these are modern cultivars. But germination, if you scarify, is much higher. You have a full stand of plants. Some of the seeds are lost because of shattering, but you can have a profitable crop. You invest 40 grams and you get more than 170, okay? Which is not the case if the seeds are like, behave like the wild type, okay? So without free germination, pea cultivation results in net loss of grain and energy. Such a trait can be defined as a crucial domestication trait. So, if you think about the domestication uh, syndrome traits and you uh, think about the fact that, uh, um, that plants were domesticated some 10,000 years ago and underwent a, a continuous evolution under domestication ever since, if you go to the wild and you take wild wheat or wild pea and you compare it to a modern cultivar, the comparison by definition must include those traits that were changed during the pristine domestication episodes and also traits that may have changed 100 years ago or 200 or 2000 years ago. So we cannot assume that all the morphological or physiological differences observed between present day wild plants and domesticated plants are the result of the domestication episode itself. Therefore, it is 
it would be useful to develop a reliable biological distinction between the genuine, crucial, just like the seed dormancy that I, I demonstrated earlier, uh, uh, traits and, uh, uh, and, and differentiate those from traits that evolved post uh, domestication. And we have discussed this in, uh, together in this, uh, in this paper that you see the title here. So if you look, for example, at the growth habit, okay, this is wild wheat and this is domesticated wheat. Okay, of course we see a difference. This is the, the dormancy phenotype. If you, if you put the seeds of wild pea in water, the most of them, 90% of them will not take up water and will not germinate. If you scarify them, like here, they will germinate. If you look at chickpea plants, for example, wild chickpea, they respond to vernalization. Vernalization is a, a cold period of growth immediately after germination. So domesticated chickpea does not respond to vernalization while, while wild chickpea does, okay? But these traits, these traits are all, are all uh, 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 translucent in the archaeobotanical record. They are useful to differentiate wild from domesticated living plants. But if you have a carbonized seed, for example, you cannot tell in, in an excavation, from an excavation, you cannot tell whether its growth pattern was like this or like this, or whether it did response to vernalization or it, it didn't, if you have a carbonized chickpea uh, uh, seed. So if one accepts the concept of, of genuine uh, domestication traits, then it follows that many other traits that differentiate between uh, uh, domesticated plants and wild ones are the result of post-domestication or as it is better termed, crop evolution under domestication processes. Um, and one way to differentiate between such traits is to, to study their genetic basis. Uh, for example, many, uh, many traits that we consider them as crucial ones, like the dormancy uh, phenotype or uh, uh, seed, uh, this uh, spike disarticulation, are inherited by a, a simple uh, uh, Mendelian uh, uh, genes. This means that there are major traits governed by one or two uh, genes. In such traits, living germplasm, living plants, can be classified into two clear phenotypic categories. For example, you can see here uh, uh, the uh, spike uh, disarticulation in, 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 in wild wheat and in domesticated forms. You can hardly see any intermediate types. Okay, so these such such traits allow allow you to uh, uh, to classify plant material rather easily. Other traits that we consider them associated, uh, most people consider them associated with the domestication uh, 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 condition. Uh, but that we feel or we think that they evolved under domestication, uh, post uh, domestication, are governed by many genes with relatively small effect. This is what uh, a geneticist called quantitative traits. Um, an example for such a trait is, is grain size. It is a, a very good uh, example. It usually presents a continuous bell-shaped uh, phenotypic distribution when you study wild material and, and domesticated uh, and germplasm. In such cases, we cannot rely on dichotomous classification like, like in the case uh, that, that you see here. So if we want to, uh, uh, if we want to use uh, traits, uh, uh, phenotypic traits uh, um, and, and, and see whether uh, whether they are useful in terms of, of classifying, uh, distinguishing between uh, domesticated plants and, and, and wild plants, we, have, we, we need to know something about the, uh, 
the phenotypic range that can be observed in the domesticated and the wild uh, uh, gene pool. So let us look at a few cases uh, of seed size in different uh, uh, groups. Here you can see the, uh, uh, the phenotypic distribution of grain, uh, grain weight in wild wheat and domesticated wheat. Of course, if you have enough samples, you can conduct a, 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 a statistical test and differentiate between the, 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 the mean of the, uh, the mean value of, of the wild genotypes relative to the domesticated ones. However, there is a considerable overlap. And you can see here again, the, the photograph of the seeds. So if you have carbonized samples of that range, you cannot, you can never be sure whether they are domesticated or wild. So there is a clear phenotypic overlap. Now, People may have well selected for large grains. There is no doubt about that. But we cannot be sure that this selection was involved in the uh, pristine domestication episode. And in the chickpea case, you can see that many desi chickpea cultivars have seeds that are similar in size to the wild progenitor of chickpea. And some domesticated ones even have seeds that are smaller than large wild ones. So again, seed size cannot serve us to, to, to cannot, is not helpful to distinguish uh, between archaeobotanical uh, material of, of, of chickpea seeds. So to summarize this, uh, we suggest the genuine domestication traits are mostly monomorphic both among the wild progenitors population and within the domesticated ones, but with the alternative phenotype, like all wild wheat have disarticulating uh, spikes and all, all domesticated wheats have non-shattering uh, spikes. Traits that are polymorphic in both wild and domesticated gene pools, in our view, are unlikely to have had a role in the genetic changes associated uh, with domestication. Still, those traits that show overlap between the wild and the domesticated gene pool and are polymorphic in both gene pools are excellent descriptors of, they cannot, they cannot be used to describe domestication, but they are excellent descriptors of, of, of crop evolution. Okay, this is what this uh, uh, slide tells us. So if, if, if we, to summarize all, all, this, all, this, all this information, and I appreciate the fact that most of you may not have uh, a good uh, or enough botanical or agronomic uh, experience. We can, we can arrange the different situations in such a table. Okay, we can, if, we, if you accept the, the notion that we can use, or we can, we, we can define domestication traits those cru crucial domestication traits like, like seed dormancy, for example, and put all the others like seed size, for example, under the category of crop evolution or the diversification traits. And if we look at the wild gene pool relative to the domesticated gene pool, we have the following situations like monomorphism here and monomorphism here. These would have spontaneous uh, seed dispersal. They would have dormancy here, non-shattering, no seed dispersal, and free germination. Another situation is polymorphism here in the wild, like for example in lentils, a range of karyotype, different chromosomal constitution. Here, a single karyotype. That means Lentil were domesticated only once and they all share the same, same karyotype. Another situation is polymorphism on both gene pools. For example, a range of seed sizes here 
a range of seed sizes here, a range of phenological adaptations here, a range of phenological adaptations here, like spring and winter types here, and also in the domesticated gene pool. Another situation could be a monomorphic, monomorphism here and a polymorphism here. For example, all wild cabbages and wild mustards look the same, okay? But if you look at the domesticated uh, 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 crops from this group, you see a range of morphologies, broccoli, kale, kohlrabi, you name it, cauliflower. So these, all these uh, forms that I mentioned of vegetables were selected under domestication and are not available in the wild gene pool. So we propose to conceptualize plant domestication as short and episodic. And during this short time, the crucial traits were manipulated by the uh, domesticators and the protracted crop evolution under domestication. So protraction can be attributed to the post domestication processes and should not be attributed to the episodic uh, domestication uh, period. And um, if you, if you, uh, uh, if you will, uh, uh, we can. Uh, um, I'm not sure it is it is needed in this con uh, in this context. Maybe uh, if there are questions, but. You have to, one has to bear in mind that the protracted uh, uh, domestication model relies on a, uh, on a long list uh, of assumption. For example, it as assumes the necessity of pre-domestication cultivation. Those are the husbandry operations that automatically select for the domestication phenotypes. They involve the use circular argumentation concerning uh, weeds of cultivation, weed remains that are uh, uh, thought to have existed in, in the fields. Um, they assume that early cultivators were unable to distinguish between brittle and non-brittle uh, cereals. Um, they also use an erroneous uh, assumption about extra work workload that was involved uh, with the post-harvest processing, like the release of the grains from the chaff. Um, they use uh, linear regressions in seed uh, uh, of change in seed dimensions, but as I showed you, uh, uh, um, seed size is not necessarily associated with the domestication uh, episode. And they also ignore the fact that there is no biological option for pre-domestication cultivation of grain legumes. This is because of their uh, strong uh, seed uh, dormancy. So all in all, all those, uh, for example, all, all those six items basically confuse biologically, agronomically confuse between plant domestication and, and corruption. And we think that modern science, like it strives for higher resolution in all fields, should this also should be expressed in, in plant domestication research. Um, I think that I will stop here, say thank you, and maybe we can entertain some questions. Thank you. Thank you. Just a moment. Uh, yeah. I, I, I have another part to finish up this, uh, this thing. If you, if you uh, uh, yes. bear with me for another please. five minutes, maybe. Please, four minutes. please. Okay, here we are. Just a moment. All right. Um, as a summary um, for, for uh, the two talks, uh, following Shahal's uh, presentations, we may say that uh, not a few biologists, geneticists, and agronomists investigate uh, plant domestication are thriving for increased resolution. They do it by refining their knowledge and understanding of, for example, the domestication syndrome traits for both cereals and legumes, or by distinguishing plant domestication from crop evolution under domestication 
as uh, Shahan showed just now. On the other hand, not a few of the archaeobotanists and archaeologists surprisingly go the other way. And instead of increasing their resolution, they lower it by way of lumping large units of time and by blurring the cultural picture and viewing the interaction between humans and plants, of course, domestication included, as a fluid, indistinctive continuum of transitional situations, thereby inevitably losing the reference to the archeological data and wasting the efforts made by generations of archeologists to provide a high resolution story. The archeological or cultural blocks used for protracted, non-centered, unconscious plant domestication models are too big, or in other words, based on too many low resolution, or too, uh, based on too low, uh, too low resolution to withstand scientific scrutiny. We are, at least for the archaeological part and for the biological too, we are splitters. And we believe in using the highest resolution possible. And since the archaeological work in the Near East provides a plus or minus 50 years or plus or minus 100 years a cultural resolution, we reject lumping large cultural blocks or envisage long-term protracted processes as is common in plant domestication research in the Near East nowadays. A conspicuous example of lumping is the pooling of the prepottery Neolithic A and early prepottery Neolithic B together. If you look at this uh, uh, slide, the PPNA, the, the, the prepottery Neolithic time or the prepottery Neolithic array is divided into two blocks of 11 to 1400 years each, which is very far from the possible resolution we have at hand. This lowered resolution hinders the opportunity to put under scrutiny the very details of the cultural histories we are discussing. Lacking a subdivision between the early, the, the prepottery Neolithic A and the early prepottery Neolithic B, as I showed you, loses the respective uniqueness of the cultural unit that these periods boast. And a most significant cultural and economic borderline is blurred. Moreover, this practice of lumping exposes any discussion of a cultural viewpoint to statements such as this, and you can see it on, on the screen, which in my view represents a loss of resolution that renders much of the good work of archeologists and others irrelevant or redundant altogether. Now the protracted autonomous model of plant domestication flourishes in this low resolution environment, which is divorced from some of the available data, archeological and biological data, as well as from the agronomy of the package, the package crop plants. The core area one event model, on the other hand, cannot, by definition, give up high resolution and praise the blurring of the picture. But rather, it looks very carefully for the exact cultural context and point in time where the earliest evidence of domestication appears, that is in the early prepottery Neolithic B from its very beginning some 10,500 years ago. Um, most important, the new state of mind, the new human perceptions of the world, the new legacy of the agricultural revolution was a full divorce from the primordial structure of sharing and of hunting, of hunters gatherers ethos of egalitarianism. This has taken us into a track of growing, a competitive world of production 
and growth. Now my last comment. We became manipulative producers. We are slaves. This is my own view. We are slaves of, of intensification and maximization. And since we are food producers for some 10,500 years, and since we are uh, intensifying food production and other industrial uh, activities all the time, and we do it very successfully, most of us believe nowadays in a very modern way that we are doomed to grow and grow and grow all the time and enlarge the volume of our economy. A standstill in economy or a retreat are economically and politically disastrous and will result in a restless world, maybe leading to the end of modernity as we know it these days. Our modern condition and our manipulations cause a lot of damage that is now reaching a global recognizable uh, scale. It includes the heated atmosphere, the rich uh, methane uh, concentrations in the atmosphere, and the landscape full of plastic, for example. It, it, it reaches the degree that we call our present geo-era by the name, by the geological term, Anthropocene, which means that we are now in charge of making a new geology. To ease our sense of guilt, if you ask me, we try to compensate the world and humanity by making museums, natural reservations, or gene banks. And this is far too late to be really efficient because by now we lost a lot of our wildlife, a lot of human cultural and lingui linguistic diversity, and a lot of the variability that characterized traditional agriculture throughout history and throughout the world. And on this happy note, we thank you all.